The word Christ in the Greek, Christos, means the anointed one. Because that's what it means, we can then say there were many Christs. There were many who were anointed to do the work of the Lord. There was only one who was the Christ, and his name is Jesus, but there were many other Christs. Moses was anointed by the Lord. David was anointed by the Lord. All of the judges of Israel, the kings, the prophets were anointed. And when you are a Christ, when you are one of the anointed, you have a special relationship with the temple. So I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but Moses, in his anointing, set up the law for the operation of the tabernacle and the tent of meeting. So it was said that there was a place you could go where God would meet you. This, this is temple theology. This is, this is what Old Testament prophets would call temple theology. There's a place you can go that God can be found, and it's the temple. There is a place where God dwells. His spirit is there. The Shekinah glory is contained there. You can actually walk there and find it. The people of Israel loved those meeting places with God. And David, probably more than any of the Old Testament dudes before the temple, looked forward to it. And he hoped that he would be able to build it for God, but God anointed Solomon for that task. They looked forward to having that place, four walls and a roof, where they could go in and surely God would be found. The temple was the place where people were reconciled with God, a place where they could sacrifice to God, a place where they could worship God. Now, good temple theology tells us that though there is a house of God, God does not dwell there. That is not his throne. His throne is in the heavens, and the temple is just where he places his feet. The Holy of Holies is not where the Lord resides, but where the train of his temple, of his robe, touches the earth. In some way, God condescends. God comes down. He allows himself to be accessible, and that place is the temple. But the temple, because it was there, because it was physical, because it was tangible, became something that could be taken lightly. It could be disregarded. You could walk by it, since you walk by it ten times a day, and become a little bit less than what it was supposed to be. Some people made the mistake of allowing the temple to be their temple. This is the Jewish temple. This is the Jerusalem temple. But that's bad temple theology because the temple belongs to God. So we're going to, I'm just going to, uh, like a freight train moving at about 100 miles an hour, we're going to go through several scriptures that establish Old Testament messianic hopes for what the temple was and what the Messiah would be when he came. Okay, so our first stop is in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. You can turn there, but the freight train's moving really fast, so I'm not going to let that hold us up. Just one verse. David has been um, finishing. He's, he's ready to die and so he has gathered all of Israel together, and he is instructing them, just as Solomon is about to be made king, and he gives a number of things to say, but he says this in chapter 29, verse 1, And David the king said to all the assembly, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great. He's talking about the building of the temple. The work is great. And Solomon's not. He's young. He's inexperienced. But the work of building this palace for God is going to be huge. 
For the palace will not be for man, but for the Lord God. So David is instructing people, and this, this is the first thing we have to know in temple theology. If we're going to have good temple theology, we have to say, the temple is not ours. The temple is God's. Right? We're allowed to go there, but it's God's. It's not ours. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, I'm going to give you a piece of a vision that a prophet named Isaiah had of the temple. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Did, did you get that? The whole earth, okay? Not just the temple, right? The temple was where the train of his robe was touching the ground. But actually, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Oh, we're going to stop there. If we're going to have good temple theology, we have to know that the temple does not contain God, right? It's where the train of his robe touches the earth. Actually, the whole earth shakes with his glory. And for us to behold the king, especially if we are having a temple experience, we are at the spot where the train of his robe is brushing against the earth. That's where we are and we experience God. We will know that he is very holy and we are not. Actually, good temple theology shows us to be a bit lacking. But it's at the temple where God reconciles. You notice here that not only does Isaiah have this profound vision of his uncleanness, but God makes provision for it and then puts Isaiah to work. So the temple is not just the spot where the presence of the Lord is, it is the spot where our unholiness is shown and God makes atonement for it and puts us to work. Now, Isaiah chapter 56, verses 6 through 8. This is um, God who's speaking. And this is Isaiah's, you know, one big, long prophecy. So... We're just going to take a little tiny bit of it. But um, Isaiah is um, preaching about what's going to happen when the foreigners have a temple experience. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. Just, you get this, right? Isaiah is saying the temple is not just for Jews. Right? He is envisioning foreigners who love God. And this is good temple theology, right? Because the temple is not the Jews' temple. It's Yahweh's temple. And so now here we have these foreigners who love God, who are being brought into the temple. And there they are making their sacrifices, and they are joyful in this house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer 
for all peoples. The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. So good temple theology is not exclusive. There is no group of humans who can put their arms around it and say, this is mine. No, 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 it's not, Isaiah says. No, it is not. That is God's. And God has made provision for it to be everybody's. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. So good temple theology says, hang on, hang on, hang on. This one little place, this temple, yes, it's where God can be found, all that sort of stuff, but he's not bound by that. Right? Because he sits in the sky and rests his feet on the earth. He's huge. What, are you guys going to build me a house? L look at the universe. I built that. What, you're going to top it? You're going to build yourself a little golden dome and... Then have me go inside of it, nice and tidy and in a little box? Uh-uh. Temple theology does not box God in. Right? Okay. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 21. I want to read to you. I actually cut down. Your um, bulletin says we're, we're going all the way to verse 27. We're not. I've pared things down a little bit so that we can get a handle on them. We'll just go to verse 17. But I, I want you to picture that you are a first century Jew with messianic hopes. You, you know Isaiah. You know these scrolls. You know the dedication of the temple. You know temple theology. You're looking forward to the anointed, the Messiah coming. Sorry, is this just going to... So I want you to picture Jesus coming near to Jerusalem here in chapter 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. And so what is this saying? The messianic hopes are actually so huge and so universal, Jesus is not sneaking in quietly through the back door. In fact, they're going to go into a nearby village, find what he needs, and takes them, and as soon as the owner comes out and goes, hey, what are you doing? Oh, the Messiah is riding it into Jerusalem. Oh, well, then by all means, let's go. It won't be a problem. It won't be stealing. They, they're ready to give. They're ready to receive the Messiah. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So, the people of Israel, the Jewish nation at this time, was looking for a conquering hero who was going to come in this enigmatic way, not on a war horse, with a sword in his hand. Right? Not even on a horse, on a donkey. And then not even on a donkey, on a colt, a little donkey, right? And I have seen, you know, when I was in Iraq, we saw these crazy giant contraptions that people would put behind a donkey. One of the most ridiculous things you can see is a big person riding with their feet sort of splayed out on a little donkey as it's trotting down the side of the road. It looks ridiculous. And this is how Jesus is coming. And in fact, it's said, it is said, and this is said by the commentators, so take it what you will. There's actually two donkeys here. 
the one that Jesus is writing is the colt. It's the little one, and the mom has to be brought along, otherwise it won't go because it's so young. So Jesus is on a tiny donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. So do the crowds know what's going on here? Do they know what Jesus is doing? Oh, you betcha. They know the prophecies, and Jesus is fulfilling the prophecies. He's coming in and purposefully fulfilling the prophecies. Go do this, because remember that prophecy? We've got to fulfill that. So here's this little colt. Jesus is sitting on it. The crowds are all gathered around. Now, you recall, Jesus is an incredible miracle worker. He's an incredible teacher. There's nobody who's been able to stand up to uh, the force of his calling. And the blind and the lame are being made whole, and the dead are being raised to life. And people are asking, if this guy is just a prophet, this has to be the ultimate prophet because we have, we've never seen or heard of people who were born blind receiving their sight for the first time. And with all of these things. And so Jesus gets on the colt. The crowd knows what's happening. I want you to feel with me that emotional mob rush as people are running and cutting down branches off of trees. They're throwing their coats on the ground for Jesus to make his royal entry into Jerusalem to the temple. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So the word Hosanna is, um, here's the easiest way to translate it. Huzzah! Okay? It actually comes from Psalm 118, from what I read to you this morning. It's two words put together, meaning save us now, we pray. Like, we're praying for you to rescue us. It's the, it's the rescue prayer, okay? That was in Hebrew. They didn't speak Hebrew at the time. They spoke Aramaic. And so it was one of those two words that had been turned into one word and transliterated, not translated. Everybody with me? Okay, so they're making the same noises from their mouth, um, but it sort of takes on a new meaning, right? And so this word, Hosanna, became this rallying cry, though it originally meant, save us, we pray, the prayer of rescue. Hosanna! So they're shouting Hosanna! They're shouting Hosanna, and it had sort of become what I just said, huzzah, you know? Hooray! Sort of like that. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, Hosanna in the highest doesn't mean really big hurrah. What it means is the expectation for salvation is not a low salvation. The salvation that they are looking for is the highest. It's the utmost. It's Hosanna in the highest. Can you... The, to me, the... The heartbeat of the crowd is just, it's tangible. The expectation is just tangible. There, there's like when you watch something on the Olympics and, you know, some great athlete gets that gold medal that nobody's ever gotten before and you say to yourself, like, wow, I, I got to see that. I was a part of it. I was, imagine that times about a million. These people are totally and completely wrapped up in the moment as they should be. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? So it wasn't just these Messianic Jews. All of a sudden, the whole city is in an uproar, and the people who don't have any me Messianic expectations goes, what the heck is going on? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple of God. Now, if you have the ESV, you don't have of God. You have a footnote. And then at the bottom it says, some manuscripts add of God. It's very important. Matthew is claiming that Jesus entered the temple of God. 
He did not enter the Jewish temple. He did not enter the Jerusalem temple. He entered the temple of God. That's good temple theology. Matthew's setting us up, all right? He's giving us the old underhanded arc right down the pipe. He's about to smack something out of the park. Jesus entered the temple of God and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. I want you to see Christ in this messianic hope. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And so Jesus is kicking over the tables. He's pushing stuff over, pushing people out of the way. Now, the temple has a guard. It has priests. It has Pharisees. There's people who make sure this thing runs well. Okay? Pilate is going to say to the Pharisees when they say, you put a guard over his tomb because that guy said he was going to raise up in three days. And this is what Pilate said back to them. You have an armed force, you do it. And so the temple has a small army. And this army is either caught up in what Jesus is doing, um, or they're so scared with this huge mob that is with Jesus that they dare not resist him. Power. And as he's doing that, the blind and the lame are coming to him, and he's healing them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? Because this is just too much for them. Because now there is no way for Jesus to deny that he is making the claim that he is the son of God. There's no way. Because the children are running around saying it for him. He has fulfilled all of these prophecies, right? Now, Jesus didn't go around going, I'm the son of God, I'm the son of God, I'm the son of God. When people said, are you the son of God? He said, look and see. Are you the Messiah or should we wait for another? Um, the blind are healed, the lame are walking, the poor have good news preaching. So you tell me. So the Pharisees could never like nail him on that because he never just outright made the claim. But here he's standing in the temple and the children are running around screaming, Hosanna to the son of David. And they say, do you hear them? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have perfected praise. So this is Jesus' sort of rebuttal. They say, do you hear those children? And Jesus says, I do. Do you? Do you hear them? Do you hear what they're saying? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. All right, that's where we're going to stop as far as the text reading goes. Um, but I wanted to take just a really, really brief break. Um, I want to read that again, the whole thing, without all my commentary. You now get the picture. You see the picture. You see what Jesus is doing, all right? Let me, so something that Christianity had to struggle with is what happens when the temple's actually destroyed, the physical temple's actually destroyed. Temple theology is still really important, right? And all of these believers, Je Jesus, to have a Jesus without the context of a temple is to not be able to understand who Jesus is. So the church had to do something because Jesus did something with the temple. He did something there. And when he died, it says that the veil was rent in two, that the foundations of the temple shook. And do you remember in Isaiah where he said that's what he saw? Right? So Jesus does something to the temple. He unleashes it. He grows it. He makes it into something that it was sort of unthought of before. To give those to you, I'm going to read first from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 
Now, Paul, who is an apostle, is making an argument to the Corinthian church because the Corinthians were really divided people, and there were all of these little sects in the church, and they're always constantly fighting, and one of the greatest threats to the church at that time was the church itself. You know, they would go around shanking each other in the alleyways because of differences, okay? And so Paul is going to argue here that um, there is just one church, and this is what he says. Let's start in Verse 13, and he's talking people to beware of their works. So he says, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it, meaning judgment day, because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. So Paul's beginning to talk about their lives as if they are a building. There's a foundation. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? So if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Paul is arguing that each individual Christian heart, that the person is the place at which the hem of the robe of God touches the earth. He is arguing that the individual, the person, is the place in which God can be found. He is arguing that inside of each one of us, we are a work, a temple that God has built that he might reconcile us to himself that can now be done in the heart and then again in the book of first corinthians chapter six it seems that the corinthians not only had trouble you know with stabbing each other in the dark alley but also visiting prostitutes and doing other stuff that was really bad and so paul is telling them to leave sexual immorality behind and here's his argument chapter six i'll start in verse 18 Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So Paul furthers the argument. He says that when somebody does something that they shouldn't with their genitalia, they are, they are actually making something that God has made holy, unholy. They are guilty of profaning the very temple of God. So when we are thinking about the temple, we are thinking about ourselves. And when we start thinking temple theology, we have to start thinking about it right here, right here, right here. By this action, I mean the things that we do in our life that might not have been clear. So let me read from Ephesians chapter two, because there's another place where temple theology is applied. Here it's the clearest. Peter does the same thing. And then there's some other early church documents, but this one's the clearest. Chapter 2, and I'll start in verse 17. But Paul is urging the Ephesian Gentile and Jewish believers to become united in body, right? So a bunch of individuals, but the individuals are forming into essentially two major sects of the church. And Paul says that because Jesus is who he is, they're not allowed to do that. Verse 17, and he came, Jesus came, and preached peace to you who were far off, the Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, the Jews. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. See, he's using this building stuff for the church. 
in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So Paul argues that one of the reasons they can't be doing all of this division stuff is because God has built them into a single structure, namely the temple. The church is the temple. Now, we live in a day and age where everybody likes to sort of confuse, well, what is the church, what isn't the church, that sort of stuff. I just want to tell you, we, at a bare minimum, we here this morning, the adopted church, we are the temple of the living God. We are taught in Scripture that we are where God rests his feet on earth. We are where the train of his robe touches the ground. We are the place that someone can go to find God. We are the place at which someone can come and have their sins forgiven, be reconciled to God Almighty within our body. That they can have their sins atoned for here in our midst. That they can be set and taught to worship here in our midst. Isn't that powerful? Yes. So I want to... Um, read the triumphal entry again. And I want you to think about this allegorically, okay? Not metaphorically, allegorically. So Jesus is going to come into the temple, and when you hear the word temple, you are to be reminded that it is you he is coming to. That it is your church he is coming to. And let's read the story sort of in that. And, and so because it's an allegory, whenever the children do something, you think about some place in your life or in your church that represents the children, that represents the lame, the blind, the Pharisees. I'm going to do sort of all that as I read it. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread, spread their cloaks on the, on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him, that followed him, were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer. But you... Make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouths? of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out to the city of Bethany and lodged there. Let me give you three very simple points. One, Jesus has come to your heart this morning. He is prepared to make it what it's supposed to be. So, we get to choose how we react. So, Christ comes humbly, but powerfully. 
He comes in triumph. He has already won the victory, but he's not coming to you this morning on a war horse. That will happen, but not this morning. He comes not with the sword in his hand. That will happen, but not this morning. He comes on the foal of a donkey. And he comes into the temple and he starts making things right. And he says, the temple is supposed to be a house of prayer. You, individuals of the adopted church, your heart is supposed to be a house of prayer. But do you know what you've made it? You've made it a den of robbers. Don't worry about that. Jesus is going to set it right. You don't have to, you don't have to do the work. All you got to do is cheer. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Get them money changers in my heart, Jesus. You, the adopted church, collectively, us, we. This place is supposed to be a place of prayer. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. But we have made it a den of robbers. Jesus is going to make it all right. Jesus is going to do that. I'm not asking you to run around kicking things over. But I'm asking you to cheer when Jesus does. Two. Christ comes to make the temple what it is supposed to be. Nobody has better temple theology than Almighty God. Nobody has a better understanding of what your heart is supposed to be, about what our church is supposed to be than the Son of the Most High God, and He has come this morning to make it what it's supposed to be. And it includes healing the blind and the lame. Those blind places in our hearts, the lame places... He invites us to be healed. And furthermore, Christ comes to make your heart reconciled to Him. This church reconciled to Him. That this would be a place of sacrifice. That your heart would be a, a spot where sacrifices come up and are holy and pleasing and acceptable to God. And most of all, the temple is a place of worship. Christ has come to make it that. So I want you to see something because otherwise you might hear just a lot of condemnation and you've got a lot of stuff to change. Who came to change it? Right? Who is Jesus? God. Does anybody else see how crazy this is? That God makes this temple, this place where he can be found. We dirty it up. He fixes it through the human effort. Jesus was God in human flesh. And God can, through us, cleanse the temple of our heart, the temple of our church. That is something that God does through us. And number three, notice that the Pharisees are indignant. But who was indignant first? Jesus, right? Righteous indignation. He goes into the temple. He starts kicking stuff over, throwing people out. I'm not sure if he's like marching them by their ear and throwing them out or if he is actually sort of brawny enough to give them the old heave-ho while the crowds are cheering. Jesus is doing that. Jesus is very indignant. And we have this thing that happens in our heart where Christ's indignation with us causes us to become indignant with him. Like somehow we're going to make this all about him and his problem. That way we don't have to deal with our garbage. The Pharisees are indignant because Christ is indignant. But when we choose to be indignant instead of to cheer, instead of to rally behind Jesus and allow him to do his work, when instead we stamp our foot and say, do you see what's going on here? Jesus says back, do you see what's going on here? I just want to call it to everybody's attention. The Pharisees do this. They, sort of, they stand back, right? and each one of us has a really well-protected Pharisee deep inside, stands back and says, you know what? I'm going to let this guy do what he wants. Now is not the right time. But guess what? 
just a very little bit, they're going to crucify him. They're going to catch him. They're going to crucify him. And actually, we do that in our hearts, is we allow the movement of the Holy Spirit to happen, and we yield to it because we're helpless, but we don't rally behind it. In fact, we wait for that move of the Holy Spirit to be done so that we can go right back to the way things were. Did you know, at some point, they turned these tables back right side up? Probably right after they killed him. At some point, it went right back to being a den of robbers. And so the indignation of Jesus, the cleansing of the temple, only does so much if we do not rally behind him. Because we can, as the Pharisees, get so wrapped up in what we're doing and, and what it means and how angry that makes us and why doesn't God... And Can you even hear what these kids are saying, Lord? Huh? Can you hear that, Jesus? Yes, I can, but can you? Because they're doing the right thing, right? And do you remember Jesus setting a child in the midst of the disciples, saying, unless you become... You received me as one of these little children. You cannot enter the kingdom. So let me conclude with this. Jesus has come to your heart this morning. He will make it what it's supposed to be. A place of reconciliation. A place of sacrifice and a place of worship. A place where the glory of God resides. Or, or you can be indignant. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that um, you would allow us to reflect on this truth. Father, show us the things that you're kicking over in our hearts, the things that you're kicking over in our church, the things that you are chucking out the front door. Father, will you help us to get over our spirit of indignation and to not just yield to you, but to rally behind you. Jesus, that we might become the people who say, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the son of David. Do that work in us, Lord. Make us holy. Make us what we are supposed to be, which is your dwelling place. Father, I ask that you would help us to apply that truth to our lives. In your name I pray. Amen.